Hi everybody, I'm very excited about today's lecture because it's about the Constitution, which is one of my favorite topics of all time. So let's get started. Okay, so one easy way to kind of tackle the Constitution, because I think everybody gets really nervous and thinks, oh my gosh, it's so complicated. The language is from like a gazillion years ago, ago and the founding fathers, I don't know what they were thinking, but they were writing in this really crazy way. Um, so I don't want you to get stressed out, because you're going to be fine. Um, I want you to think about the Constitution, and I want you to think about it from three basic viewpoints. Number one, the Constitution limits the power of the states. Okay, that's pretty easy to remember, right? It says, okay, states, here's what you can do, and here's what you can't do. Number two, it enumerates, now that's a fancy word for lists, okay? So it lists the powers that are granted to the federal government. So first it says, okay, states, here's what you can and cannot do. And then the second thing it does is it says, okay, I'm going to list all of these things that the federal government is permitted to do. And, and you know, basically the states are giving the federal government that power. Um, and then the third thing I want you to think about is us, you and me, the people, because the Constitution guarantees certain fundamental rights to us, the people of the United States of America. So if you kind of try to keep those three things in your head, state power, federal power, power to the people, my friends, okay? So... Here we go. First, let's look at that state power and how it's limited. Now, I want you to understand that each state is its own sovereignty. It's, it's, it, states are their own thing. You know, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, California, New York, they stand on their own. They are their own thing. That's why they have their own government. Um, that you know they've got a governor, they've got the the legislature. You know, they they do their own thing. They all have their own state supreme courts. They stand on their own. They're like little tiny mini countries, but they're not because they've all agreed to be in this great United States. They've united together. But when they did that, they didn't give up that sovereignty to be their own place. Okay? Now, each state has its inherent power to sort of enact its own laws. But the Constitution says, okay, look, if you want to be part of this big group of all of these states, there's some things that we really don't want you to do. Okay? So here they are. Number one, federalism. Okay, that's a big fancy word. All it means, hang on to your seats, my friends. All it means is that when a state law and the federal law are the same, guess who wins? Federal. It just means federal law state trumps state law. That's what federalism means. Now, where do we get that? We get that from the Supremacy Clause, which you can find in Article 6 of the Constitution. Now, I put that on this PowerPoint, and I'm telling you about it right now, because the certified paralegal exam, they're going to ask you things like, what is Article 6? What, what, what important clause can be found in Article 6 of the Constitution? So when you are doing your flashcards, when you're studying, I want to make sure that you learn the different articles, understand what the Supremacy Clause is, and also know where it's found in the Constitution. I know that's crazy. You're not going to need that in real life. You're not going to be like working at a law office and a client's going to say, well, you know, where do you find the Supremacy Clause? You're never going to get asked this question, okay? But you will get asked it on a certified paralegal exam. I can guarantee you that they're going to ask you some questions like that. So just be prepared for your studying. All right, next thing um, that the Constitution says, okay, states, you're not allowed to do this. There's this concept called preemption, okay? Now, what that means is if the federal government says, hey, we're going to do this thing, then nobody else can do it. Okay, everybody else is preempted from doing it. So one of the things and the best example and the one you're most likely to be asked about is the federal government says, hey, we're going to do the post office, man. I mean, think about this. Like when the Constitution was written, I mean, it was still sort of Pony Express days. Um, they wanted to control all of the mail. OK, and they still do. Now, there are some private companies like United States uh, or I'm sorry, UPS, the United Parcel Service, and you've got Federal Express and you've got DHL and all of these different carriers. Um, but one thing you'll notice is they don't deliver the daily mail. They deliver like express packages, express uh, envelopes, but they're not the ones bringing you your junk mail every day. 
that's still the federal government because everyone else is preempted from establishing a post office. Um, and then the last thing on this slide is police power. Um, every state has the right to regulate any area affecting its citizens, that like their general health, their safety, their welfare. But when a state law violates any provision of the Constitution, the law is going to be stricken down by the United States Supreme Court. This kind of goes along with federalism. They're saying, look, if you're going to make some state laws that conflict with our federal laws, federal is going to win. And if you're going to write laws that are, are contrary to the United States Constitution, we're going to strike those down. And we're going to tell you, you are not allowed to do that. Okay? Now, something, the states can provide more rights to their citizens then the United States Constitution guarantees them, but they cannot provide less. Okay, so that's kind of pretty much, those are the only ways that states are being limited, okay? Uh, you, and, you know, I'm not looking at the slide right now, but it's federalism, preemption, and the police power. Okay, those are the only three things where the states have been limited. Now the next part is, remember I told you, federal power. So that's the part we're getting into now. What are those federal powers that they're allowed to have? So the federal government is one of limited power. Okay, it's got no inherent power. It doesn't possess um, it, the ability to be its own sovereign nation. It only gets those because the states, the United States, have said, okay, we want this federal government, and here's how we want it to be. Okay? Um, so an important article of the Constitution is Article Number 1. This is the one that establishes Congress. Congress is comprised of the House of Representatives and the Senate. I know you guys are all familiar with these concepts. Okay, this is also called the legislative branch of government. It's where laws are created. Okay, um, so Congress exercises its powers by enacting federal statutes. That's how they show their power. They write laws. When they're not writing any laws, they're not really doing anything. Um, and this is the power that they, they have. It's all listed here on this slide. And the way they make those things happen is they write laws. So the first one on here, impose taxes. So Congress has the power to impose taxes. Well, how do they impose taxes? They write a law that says, I'm going to impose this tax. People shall pay this tax. So that's their law. That's how they enact their law, or their, that's how they um, exercise their power. So let's look at the things that they can do. They can impose taxes. They can borrow money, like, for example, from China. They can regulate interstate commerce. Interstate, that means between two states. And commerce means selling and buying and transacting goods and business. Okay? So they can regulate the business uh, interactions between two states. They can also regulate business transactions between the United States and foreign countries. They can control the bankruptcy laws. They can issue money. They can appropriate money, which means they say, um, I'm going to give this much money to the Department of Defense. I'm going to give this much, much money to the Department of Education. So they can say where the money goes. They can punish the counterfeiting of money. A lot of this has to do with money, right? Oh, look, look, looky. They can establish post offices. <laughs> um, states can't do that. <laughs> um, they can control patents and copyrights. They can create inferior federal courts. That means less than the United States Supreme Court. They can declare war. They can provide for the national defense. And they can serve as the legislature for the District of Columbia, which makes a lot of people in the District of Columbia upset because the District of Columbia is not a state. It is a district. So the state that you live in, and, you know, I live in West Virginia, so West Virginia has a legislature that, you know, basically represents the people of West Virginia. The legislature for the people that live in the District of Columbia is the United States Congress. And you know how much they get done and how much they bicker and boop, boop, boop. And they're actually acting as the legislature for the District of Columbia. So the District of Columbia does not have its own representatives. Its representatives are, they are people that come from all over the rest of the country. And if you think about it, whose interests do they want to serve? I mean, you know, my representatives from West Virginia, do you think they're more concerned about West Virginia or the folks in the District of Columbia? So it is kind of a weird system, but that's the way it works. 
and they can make any laws that are necessary and proper to carry out the powers that they've been given. Okay, so that's what Article 1 does. It establishes Congress and it gives them all of these powers. Okay, so Article 1 also says, okay, you have all these powers, but there's three things we really, you can't do. <laughs> okay, um, the first one on this list is suspend the writ of habeas corpus. That sounds like a big mouthful of legal slash Latin words that makes no sense. So here's what the writ of habeas corpus is. Okay, if I get arrested and I go to jail and I file an appeal and my appeal is denied and I'm going to be spending a long, long time like my whole life in jail and the police, the, the guards start beating me every day or they don't give me any food or they keep me in the dark or they don't give me any medical care. Um, I have the right to file what's called a writ of habeas corpus. Even though all of my other legal remedies are gone, I have this right to file a writ of habeas corpus that says my constitutional rights as United States citizens are being violated because I'm being subjected to cruel and inhumane treatment, which is a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Okay, I can file that writ of habeas corpus. I can say you are wrongfully holding me. You are violating my constitutional rights. There's a lot of ways that you can bring a writ of habeas corpus. That's just one of them. You can also say I was given ineffective assistance of counsel at my trial. Therefore, I was denied my fundamental right to have uh, an attorney represent me. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can do this. So it's really important as a United States citizen that we have the ability to file a writ of habeas corpus if our constitutional rights are being violated when we are being, when we are being held and when we, we are being incarcerated. Um, so a writ of habeas corpus, habeas corpus um, means deliver the body. <laughs> I know that sounds like, oh, dead body. No, it means human, like the body of a person. <laughs> of one held in custody. Um, now, Article 1 says that Congress may not suspend the writ of habeas corpus. It's saying they can't take that right away from a United States citizen. But there's an unless. <laughs> unless there is a rebellion ongoing or an invasion. So, if we have been invaded by... Um, somebody else, we are at war and we, our country has been invaded, Congress can issue a, uh, a suspension for the writ of habeas corpus. Um, or if part of our country has stood up and begun to rebel like, uh, rebel, like we did in the Civil War, then um, they can suspend that writ of habeas corpus. And you know why they want to do that, right? Because they want to hold prisoners of war and they don't want, they want to take away their constitutional rights. Okay, that's why they would want to do that, but otherwise they can't. You will always have that right as a United States citizen that to have that writ of habeas corpus. Okay, the next thing on the slide. Congress may not pass a law that is considered a bill of attainder. Now that's a law that's directed at a specific person or against a specific group. That would be something like uh, black people can't vote. You can't pass that kind of a law. And that kind of law is called a bill of attainder, okay? Or, you know, the CP exam is going to try to give you something that's not so obvious, like black people can't vote or women aren't allowed to have jobs, something like that. It's not going to be that obvious. It's going to be something like legal assistants are not allowed to vote. You're like, oh, well, what does that mean? Well, that's a bill of attainder. I mean, that's taking a fundamental right away from a group of people. You can't do that. Um, and then passing an ex post facto law. Congress cannot do this. Again, more Latin words, right? Well, ex post facto law is one that defines conduct as a crime after the fact. So if today it is perfectly legal for me to show you this slideshow, tomorrow they pass a law that says, oh, that Constitution slideshow, that thing is completely illegal. And anybody who watched it or, or showed it or created it is going to have to go to jail. Oh, well, they can't do that. Today, we didn't know it was illegal. You didn't know it was illegal when you were listening to my lecture today. You had no reason to know that. I had no reason to know that I was going to not only subject myself to incarceration or anybody who listens to it as I'm making this lecture. That's an ex post facto law. You can't make a law suddenly and then make it apply to everything that came before it. 
That is that is unconstitutional and you cannot do that. It would have to read that it's everything from today forward. So anybody who watches this slideshow from today forward. Okay, now that's okay, but you can't criminalize the people who didn't know they were doing anything wrong. Okay, so that finishes up Article 1, that's Congress. Okay, now Article 2 is interesting because Article 2 is the provision of the Constitution that vests the executive power in the president. And everybody thinks, oh, the president has so much power, the president has so much power. Well, when our country was created, our founding fathers were so afraid of dictators, they were so afraid of, quote, having a king, that they made sure that the president wasn't going to have that much power. Now, we just spent a whole lot of time talking about what Congress was allowed to do, and we also said states can pretty much do everything except what they're prohibited from doing um, in the Constitution. Um, and look at all the president. This is it. Right here on this slide, this is what the president can do. Okay, so number one, the president can um, appoint executive officers, including a cabinet. That's going to be like the secretary of education, um, the secretary of defense. So the, the president can appoint what's called a cabinet of executive officers. Um, these are people that assist the president. The president is, uh, the executive branch is held to enforcing the federal laws. That's why you have the FBI. OK, um, the executive branch, those are the ones that actually enforce those federal laws. Well, the president doesn't write the federal laws. Who writes the federal laws? Congress writes the federal laws. But the president is there sort of like the policeman who's going to be enforcing those federal laws that Congress writes. OK, um, the president also serves as the commander in chief for our military. So they the, the president is the one who leads our military um, when they go um, into battle. And the president can veto things that Congress does, the acts of Congress. Um, so if Congress writes a law and the president doesn't like it, the president can veto it. But then the Congress can come back and say, no, 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 two thirds of us want to override your veto. And then ultimately they can have the final say and then the president, um, his veto isn't worth anything. Um, that is the only, that's it. That's all the president can do um, all by his lonesome. Now, the next thing, this next little list of three things, th the president needs the Congress's permission to do these things. Okay, number one, make treaties with a foreign nation. Okay, so the president is allowed to, to have negotiations with a foreign nation and make some kind of a treaty. So a trade agreement or, you know, the Iran treaties, uh, it been in the news recently. Um, the president is allowed to do that, but Congress has to say yes to that treaty. The president is allowed to ab appoint ambassadors, but the Congress has to say, okay, we agree with who you appointed as an ambassador, and we're going to allow this person's nomination to move forward, and we're going to say yes. They have to give the final stamp of approval, and then finally they can appoint judges to the Supreme Court, which is their, in my opinion, the number one most powerful thing that the president can do, because as you will find out when we get to the next article, um, that the Supreme Court really has the most power out of all three branches. Um, so this is it. That's all the president can do. So for everyone who thinks that the president makes such a big deal and who's president really, really matters, it does and it doesn't. It's more important who is on the Congress. Okay, Article 3, and this is who's really important, who's on the Supreme Court. Article 3 grants judicial power to the United States Supreme Court and such other inferior courts as Congress may establish. This is where Article 3 says United States Supreme Court, this is our judi judicial branch. And what's kind of funny is that the framers of our Constitution thought, oh, the judiciary is, quote, the least dangerous branch of the three. They thought that the, ju that the Supreme Court was going to be the least likely to sort of take power and start acting in, in, a, in a way that would really dramatically impact the United States citizens more than any other branch. But what happened in Marbury versus Madison, okay, um, 
is that the Supreme Court gave themselves a little bit more power than was originally anticipated by the founders of our Constitution. Okay, that third bullet point, it says the Supreme Court is the power to review acts of the legislature, that's Congress, and the executive branches to make sure that they're in compliance with the Constitution. That's their job. That's their function. But in Marbury versus Madison, here's what they said. They permanently established themselves as the court of final review. In other words, we have the final say. You can't override my decision, Congress. President, you can't override my decision. There is nowhere else to go after the Supreme Court. There is no appeal after the Supreme Court. What they say happens. So, after Marbury versus Madison, which is a case they themselves, de they declared themselves the, the court of final review in Marbury versus Madison, they, um, the phrase became, the Supreme Court is not the last because it is always right. It is always right because it is the last. It is the last along the line. That's it. There's nowhere else to go. Okay, so those were the three branches of government. Article 1 was Congress. It was the legislative branch. Article 2 was the president, also known as the executive branch. And number 3 was the Supreme Court, also known as the, ju as the judiciary. Those are our three branches of government. Okay, um, and so that is that whole second thing. Remember I told you at the beginning of the slideshow, number one, the Constitution was going to limit the power of the states because the states have ultimate power except they were limited in certain ways, right? Number two, the Constitution lists or tells us what the federal government can do. We just finished that section. Okay, and this is the last thing that the Constitution really does is it guarantees you and me our individual rights. Okay, so the fundamental rights for you and me are found in the first 10 amendments. That is also called the Bill of Rights. I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to read all 10 of these or go through them in great detail. You know what they are. Some of them are more important than others. Um, some of them you hear about more than others. Um, but these are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Okay? I want to zero in on the, the some things. So if the question is, um, what's the Bill of Rights? Well, it's the first 10 amendments. Okay? So just kind of remember that. This comes after that. So this is like the 14th Amendment. Okay? Um... So what's so special about the 14th Amendment? Well, this is another one that we talk about all the time. That says that the states cannot make or enforce any laws that diminish the privileges and immunities of any citizen of the United States. Okay? It basically says, the 14th Amendment, is the states cannot make a law that gives the citizens, their citizens, fewer rights than the United States Constitution guarantees them. The 14th Amendment sets this in stone. It says, states, you can make whatever laws you want, but you cannot make a law that gives your citizens fewer rights than is guaranteed to them by the United States Constitution. Okay? It further requires that states must provide what's called due process of law, um, and we'll get to that in another slideshow, and what's called the equal protection of the laws. You have to treat your people equally and you have to give them due process of law. Sometimes the 14th Amendment is called the Equal Protection Clause because that's where the people really, um, it, it says it right in the Constitution, you are guaranteed equality and, and, and equal rights. Okay, um, now this is a little bit tricky. Roe versus Wade is a very famous case. It's, it's, it's the abortion case, okay? It's 1972. And Roe versus Wade, one of, the, one of the big issues was right of privacy, okay? Um, a lot of people say, okay, well, I have a fundamental right to privacy, and it's guaranteed to me by the Constitution. And, and, and it's true that you have a fundamental right of privacy, but it's not so much that you got it from the Constitution. It's that you got it from the Supreme Court, that said that there was a fundamental right of privacy guaranteed to all people in the Constitution. But it doesn't say it specifically anywhere in the Constitution. The Supreme Court 
um, said that they found this right of privacy in what's called the penumbras of the Constitution as part of the Necessary and Proper Clause of Article 1, um, section, section 818. So if you, if, you look at, if you look at it, they're not specifically mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. So you may find yourself with a question on the CP exam that says, where would you find the fundamental right of privacy in the Constitution. If one of those answers is not the Supreme Court declared it and found it in the penumbras, then don't pick like Article 3, Article 2, Article whatever. Don't pick something um, unless it's Article 1, 818. Okay? All right. Due process. Here's the slide about due process. The Fifth Amendment. This is part of the Bill of Rights. Remember, the Bill of Rights is the first ten. The Fifth Amendment says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law by the federal government. The federal government has to provide you with due process. Citizens, other citizens, do not have to provide you with due process. This is only when the government is coming in and they're trying to arrest you or detain you or something. Um, this is government action against you. They have to follow certain guidelines. Um, the 14th Amendment backs this up. The 5th Amendment says federal government has to provide it to you. The 14th Amendment says that states have to provide it to you. So, and as I said, due process is not an issue unless state action is present. Once state action exists, this is the government, this is the police, this is somebody coming at you, due process is either classified as substantive due process or procedural due process, okay? Um, so what's the difference between substantive and procedural? Well, first we're going to talk about substantive due process. Um, when you have, like, let's say there's a, a, thou shalt not kill, right? That's from the Ten Commandments, okay? But there's also a lot of laws that say you cannot kill somebody. So we're just going to use that simple example. There's a law that says, um, Mary is not allowed to kill people. Nobody's allowed to kill people, but we're going to talk about Mary. Mary shall not kill another person. Okay, so let's say Mary kills another person. Okay, the law that said that Mary wasn't allowed to kill that person, that's substantive law. That is the substance of the law. That is the meat of it. That is the law itself. Procedural law is what happens to Mary after she kills somebody and violates that law. When the police knock on her door to arrest her, that's when procedural law comes in. It's the procedure through which we enforce our substantive laws. So procedural, so anything from the arrest to the incarceration, to the trial, to the motions practice, to the sentencing, to the appeal process. That's all the procedure that is used in order to make sure that Mary um, goes through due process of law. Okay? Um, and it's the procedure, it's the procedural law that we use. So, where does the substantive due process come in? Because most often we're dealing with procedural law when we're talking about due process. But if the law itself, that law that says Mary shall not kill, if there's something wrong with that law, then that can also violate my rights as a citizen if the law was written poorly. And that's mostly what we're dealing with when we talk about substantive due process. That law itself has to be fair, okay? Um, the content of it has to make sense. So let's see what's in here. Arbitrary or capricious. This is where the content of that law is fundamentally unfair. It shocks the conscience. It's unreasonable, okay? So the, the law that says that you should not kill other people that's perfectly reasonable. And the way I stated it, it applies to everybody, okay? But what about a law that says, um, thou shall not breathe? Now, what's wrong with that? Well, that's just ridiculous. Everybody has to breathe. If you can't breathe, you're going to die. That's dumb. That shocks the conscience. Everybody's like, that's a crazy law. Well, if that is the law and Mary's being accused of violating a law that says she shouldn't breathe when, I mean, she has to breathe to live, 
That's stupid. Okay, that's an arbitrary or capricious type of a substantive due process violation. The law is ridiculous. It's fundamentally unfair. It shocks the consciousness. Okay, um, over breath. This is where the state has a legitimate purpose for the law, but the language isn't really tailored to suit the purpose that they intended. Okay, let's go back to that thou shalt not breathe law. Okay, well, that was a law that maybe, um, you know, the state designed because they didn't want people inhaling chemicals when they went into um, factories. Okay, so the intent was, well, we don't want people breathing in um, these noxious chemicals. We're trying to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens, and we're allowed to do that. Okay. Well, they wrote it. They wrote it in a poor fashion. It was overbroad. It applied to everybody in every place and everywhere in every situation because they said, thou shalt not breathe. This is ridiculous. So not only was this law arbitrary and capricious um, and it's fundal fundamentally unfair, but it was overly broad. How about let's streamline this a little bit. Let's be a lot more specific um, legislature so we can get this um, law sufficiently tailored to meet the purpose that you meant. Otherwise, it's going to apply to people that it never meant to apply to. And then vagueness, okay? This happens when a person of normal intelligence cannot tell from the statute's language what conduct is prohibited or what's required of them, okay? This is where you read something, you're like, huh? What did that mean? I have no idea what that means. Am I allowed to like uh, am I allowed to breathe on Sundays? Can I breathe on Monday? Can I breathe every day? Where can I breathe? I don't know where I'm allowed to breathe. This law is ridiculous. It's vague, okay? It obviously can't mean that I'm not allowed to breathe ever because that uh, I would die, okay? So this, this type of poorly written law can violate someone's substantive due process because of these three things. Some things are so egregious that they meet all three requirements, but some will only meet one of these. Um, and if it is the case that a court finds that, that these were met, then a due process violation could have occurred. Okay, so procedural due process. So looking at the law itself with substantive. Now let's look at how do you arrest somebody? Um, what do you do with this person? Okay, so procedural due process requires... For an arrest to be fundamentally fair, for the government to come in and, and threaten to take your, your liberty, okay, they have to provide you with notice. They have to tell you why you are being arrested. What are you being charged with? Okay, and number two, an opportunity to be heard. You have to have a hearing where you have the opportunity to defend yourself. Okay, so... Procedural due process consists of notice and the opportunity to be heard. Well, that's all I have for the Constitution. Um, I'll see you again um, when we get to some other lectures. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I, I hope uh, you found this lecture informative.